Welcome to Lou Palumbo's Between the Lines. Problem solving for our future. Lou. Common sense, logic, and reasoning. Lou. The man that can't stand hate and animus. Lou. Stimulating the thought process of America. Lou. Where being right is not political, it's factual. Lou. Providing real solutions in real time. And now, here's your host, Lou Palumbo. Wish I could tell you something has changed, but um, it hasn't. We're still in the same mode that we have been for quite some time, or at least the past almost two years. A lot of interesting questions, I think, that need to be asked and answered. One of them deals with the border issue. We're trying to figure out who's supposed to benefit from this border policy with this indiscriminate access of people who are fleeing countries, some of them legitimately oppressed, which is why we need a, a migration process for a number of reasons. In fact, if you recall, a number of months ago, we had a gentleman by the name of Richard Herman, an immigration attorney, helps immigrants assimilate or facilitates the process by which they can come to the United States and be productive and ultimately become citizens. You know, we need a workforce. We're going to have um, Robert Boyce back on uh, in a few minutes. He's uh, f- formerly and recently retired chief of detectives of the New York City Police Department. He was in charge of approximately 7,000 detectives. And he's going to tell you something interesting about uh, the migrants that he has encountered out on eastern Long Island, which is where he has one of his homes. It's really very positive, And if it uh, supports the fact that we do need migrants in the country. But there's got to be a method to the madness, and that just simply is absent from this discussion. Um, I have to be really candid, and I don't want to be uh, political or um, negative, but, you know, basically what's going on at the border is treason. And the reason I say that is because your FBI director, as I constantly remind you, identified the southern border of the United States at Mexico as a threat to our national security. That would make an incumbent upon the president and those he appointed, like Mallorca and the border czar Kamala Harris, to do something about the border. Not to mention the El Paso uh, city mayor, who's a Democrat, has declared a state of emergency. There are numerous Democratic elected officials in Texas and Arizona that are screaming to Washington for help. I'm trying to figure out why they're turning a blind eye to this, but I do tell you it's going to become the litmus test for the Republican Party who will shortly take control of the House of Representatives. And, you know, this cannot be an exercise in vengeful politics that every time the party uh, base shifts that we start to go after the other party. That's not about evening the score, but there are some questions that need to be answered regarding this border because what's transpiring there is going to burden and tax this country. I want to say something else to you, and it's on the heels of comments I make to you all the time about population growth. We are overpopulated, and I'm comfortable in saying that because we demonstrate on a daily basis the inability to take care of the people that are in this country, over 335 million. If I can just remind you, the Census Bureau says 335 million. Chuck Schumer adds another 11 million plus These are the migrants he wants to give amnesty to and ultimately afford them the luxury, the privilege of being able to vote in our elections. So that's bumping you up right there to about 350. You know, we're not taking care of the people here that we have. Our elderly, our veterans, which is shameful, the mentally ill, the homeless, our children. We're not really taking care of our children. reason I say that is can't send your children into a learning environment, a movie theater, or a mall without people being armed to protect them. That's symptomatic of a much bigger problem, guys. you got to plug into what's going on in your country. You know, I cannot wait to see what the fallout is of this Christmas shopping season where people traditionally bang the living hell out of their credit cards so they don't disappoint their children and their other family members or whomever is important to them. But we're going to see it in January. It's going to be quite interesting, I have a feeling. I I don't know why we are so far off the rails, but I do know we're overpopulated. You know, the reality of the situation is as things grow, um, so do the problems exponentially with the growth. And there's no no difference with the population of the country. I remind people it was 150 million roughly when I was born. Don't take me 
on my word. Please Google this. You can find this information for yourself. In fact, I don't want you to be spoon-fed by anything I say. You will know this, though. When I say something to you, it will be factually based and truth-driven. If it's my opinion, I'm going to tell you it's my opinion. Conjecture, speculation, all those things that the media employs on a daily basis. Speaking of the media, this is our nemesis now. You know, we're talking about tyranny in the government. We're dealing with a tyrannical media. I don't know what people don't understand. I know of no other institution protected by the Constitution that operates with such impunity and such irresponsibility. They've decided to step away from the truth and try to feed political agendas. I don't really care about political agendas. You guys, you don't really, if you don't know me, you're really... I'm not saying you're missing something, but I got very simple thinking. I'm worried about my children. I'm worried about the future of this country. I don't care about the Republicans. I don't care about the Democrats, especially when their policies and their agendas are not consistent with what's best in the best interest of this country. And I would say both of them are a little lackluster, to be very candid with you. I hate the extremism in both of these parties, these wings that exist you know, in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. You know, there's a fix to all of this, though. You know, we need leadership. I tell you this not because I have any skin in the game, but there's a young man sitting in Florida that I think can reach across the aisles and reach out to um, the masses of this country, which is going to be hard because we've overpopulated the country. You know, I wish people would go back and just take the time and listen to some of the speeches that were given by John Kennedy when he spoke to this country and the whole country felt included. There's always going to be people on the fringe. The world felt included. But again, he was the president. Population was 180 million, almost doubled since his presidency. This is getting interesting out here, folks. You know, I understand now that the uh, federal government is constructing these rather elaborate tents on the border in El Paso to accommodate migrants. How about you accommodate the homeless people that are just peripheral? I'm not even going to say that word. That are just all over the place in Los Angeles and the mentally ill. They're doing nothing to help them. There isn't even lip service for that matter. The last time I heard them mentioned was when they passed this bipartisan gun control bill of some form where we're going to have enhanced background checks, which is just nonsense, just rhetoric. And we're allocating funding towards the mentally ill and we're allocating funding towards, you know, school safety. Last week, when we're going to have these gentlemen back on. I had Jeff Muller and uh, Steve Sullivan who, who are going to speak to you a bit more in depth about the school safety issue. This is deplorable. Not that we haven't so much, you know, put law enforcement agents in every school across the country, but that we're having this conversation that we need to. When is the public going to pull the heads out of their heinies here? Stop worrying about your laptop, generation of iPhone, whether or not you can afford an electric car on your vacation. Pay attention to your country because you're losing your country. I strongly suggest that if we do not have a dramatic course correction next five years, we're going to lose the country. The country's going to fragment. We're going to see states like Texas that are somewhat economically viable. I shouldn't say somewhat. They are. Florida, Nevada, Tennessee, quite a number of these states are going to basically break off from the federal government and say, look, we're not going to play ball with you guys anymore. Go do what you want to do with the other 45 states or 40 states or however many states remain under the auspices of this craziness that we're living but they're going to step away you know you got to look at texas they're just chomping at the bit there's nothing good in this relationship between texas and the federal government and the one real stumbling block is this border issue and i've been telling you just go back and review my podcast so these radio shows that i just stopped doing on wbob i mention it constantly about the border issue it's it's now creeping up on us people throughout this country are becoming alarmed New York City now has 30,000 migrants that have been delivered into that city. Some, by the way, by the mayor of El Paso. I understand he brought like 11,000. What's the reaction from Eric Adams? He wants a billion dollars from the government. No, actually he wants a billion dollars from the taxpayer. That's what that's about. You're all going to foot this bill. This is getting ridiculous. You know, I want to see what the Republican Party does, not because they want to even the score with the Democrats, but because we have something wrong right now in this government. And I'm not saying that because I'm a Republican. I'm saying that because I'm an American. It's a whole different discussion for me. I am so divorced from this agenda and this political lunacy. You know, you wouldn't believe it. But I do tell you this. We've got treason going on in our country. Folks, that's a very strong word. 
What's happening on our southern border is treason. And on the heels of that last comment about, you know, the drugs coming across, I'm going to introduce now um, someone who I am proud to call a friend. This man is brilliant. Um, you merely need to understand what he did in the New York City Police Department as the chief of detectives. He's recently retired. Chief Robert Boyce. Chief, are you there? I am. I don't, oh, see, I don't right. see you, though, sir. Okay, let me see if I can make that happen. Then. And the reason I want to see you is because I want to see if you have a suit, a jacket, and tie on. You know I do. And, and in deference <laughs> and in deference to you, I there put you a go. jacket on today, but no tie. That's a nice tie, by the way, Bob. A brand new Brooks Brothers got, got it. You picked up the other night. Very nice you gift. So, so thank, thank, you. thank you for joining us. I see you have your detective division pin on, and you're losing, looking <laughs> dapper as usual. It's never far from me, Lou. That's for sure. I, my I, uh, my well, background in uh, my pro. We lost you there for one second, Bob. Yeah. Re repeat that, Bob. I got you now. So uh, it's never far from me. I was uh, uh, 35 years in the police department. Uh, so many friends, I can't even, I couldn't even begin to tally how many uh, that is still in close contact with, as, as with members of the community. So you see, you still, even though you're out and you're, uh, I mean, it's been four years now, coming up on five, uh, you still keep, uh, keep close ties because you help build something. You don't want I, I want you to acknowledge that I put a jacket on today for you because I haven't worn a jacket on the show since you. I can't do I, it. I, it's a fine looking jacket too, by the way. And uh, please explain the lapel pin. That's, that's actually my company lapel pin that I designed over 30 years, uh, over 30 years ago. It was patriotically I mean, I, driven. Yes, I see it. It's nice. I like it. You yeah. know, uh, so I want to lapel pin you to be worn, you know, one at a time and then outside of that, no more. I want to catch up with you. Tell us a little bit about what you're most recently uh, been involved in with developing, because the last time we spoke, you know, you had New York Homicide, which was a great show, and I encourage people to watch it. You know, it's actual cases in the New York City Police Department with the detectives that actually were involved solving them, not actors. So bring us up to speed, Bob. So we finished up our season of 12 episodes, and uh, it ran through January through March. Well, we have a second season, and uh, we're putting it together now. We're filming now. And the show is essentially is about the New York City detective, what they face when, when, uh, when they walk into a homicide scene. You know, what they can immediately glean, what they run with, and how the case twists and turns. But I think what I'm most proud of is when you see their relationship with the victims' families. The victims' families are really important. <laughs> these, these are folks who will never get that back, never get become whole again. And so we try to help them through that as best we can, keeping them plugged in and also listening to them because sometimes they can give you advice about what's going on in that person's life that's important to understand. So, um, so that's what the show is about. It's about technology. We have one show from uh, last year. From, we try to bring in the old shows as well, the old homicides cases, excuse me. Um, so we can show that the detectives really had nothing to go on as far as technology goes. Uh, like they do today. We have cameras all over the city, as you well know. So we try to show the old cases as well. And then I think that's reflective of uh, the same speed. Bob, we got a little hesitation on you there. Can you hear me? You, 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 you Bob, we got a little hesitation there. You're, you're frozen right now. Bob, you're frozen on the screen. As you go to the city, my detective's accents change quite a bit. Interesting. Um, I think it's worth mentioning. Don't you do some work with ABC also? I do. I'm an ABC contributor, news contributor. So if something happens somewhere in the country, um, I will go on the air or, or even a phone call at some, at some points. You know, active shooter situations, crime, homicides. And that, that I've been on local news as well as uh, 2020 and other ABC uh, programs as well. Very happy with that. Um, uh, we're able to get the perspective of law enforcement on some of these issues. What And basically is what the chief is going through at that time on an active shooter. We've seen good and we've seen bad, Lou, and you know that. <clears throat> we've seen really good stuff that just goes off the, uh, off the, uh, off the news um, shelf. And we've seen things like Uvalde, which went so bad in so many ways. So we comment, I comment on that as well. Yeah, you know, um, I'm not going to get into it right now, but this Idaho homicide with these four you know we, uh, hopefully we'll have time later bob to speak about that because i've given you my perspective on this i think they've got a serial killer that's just my opinion but um i want to ask you what's going on in law enforcement currently because we just went through 
um, the midterm elections. And I told you myself that I was somewhat confident that there would be a, a real dramatic pushback, independent of politics and agenda, where people would put into into place, you know, elected officials that are going to, I would say, support, um, I w say for cities, for example, like in L.A., they elected Karen Bass. You know, we still have Lightfoot in Chicago. They elected uh, Kathleen Hochul, who hasn't even mumbled repealed bail reform, which is why the city so pigeonholed. So give us a little update as to what in the wide world of sports is going on in our cities. And speak to New York well, we, specifically that you have intimate knowledge of. We we have so many problems, it's hard to, hard, it's hard to find out stuff where. But in New York City, as I look at, and I see throughout the country as well, um, we're, uh, they, to their credit, the NYPD credit, has decreased homicides this year um, in, in a really 9% that's 63 less people murdered from last year. That's good news. Shootings are down substantially, 263 shootings now. However, if you look at more than a one-year one comparison, and you look, we breach it out to like three years, you can see we're up substantially in New York. When I think uh, my last full year was 2017, we had 283 homicides. Right now, we sit at 481. That's over 200 homicides, more than we had just a few years ago. So it's not all great news. It's better news because he was uh, Mayor Adams has been given a, a really a, a tough assignment coming in on the previous mayor. And uh, he's charismatic. There's no question. Um, he seems to be working very hard, but he's got to get all of help in getting this thing turned around. Some of these ter horrendous uh, bail reform laws that were passed have to be either repealed or significantly changed to allow uh, judges to uh, to be more powerful in, in, in uh, leveling uh, bail on certain people. Bob, well, I want to ask you a question that, that I know you have the answer to. You mentioned that the homicides are down and the shootings are down. And isn't that the byproduct of a more proactive getting guns off the street approach? But in saying that, what's the prosecution rate with these guns that are being taken off the street? How many of those cases are being prosecuted is a big question. That's a continuing problem. And in some, we have five... Uh, um, district attorneys in New York, some are better than others, um, but we see a, a, a reluctance to prosecute gun arrests. And we see that same individual coming back to possess another gun and sometimes using it and shooting someone, especially with gangs. The good news is that the gang um, prosecutions are back up because that's what's driving the numbers here. The gang culture, which is all about in, in neighborhoods that I worked, <clears throat> East New York and Brownsville and South Bronx, I worked all those neighborhoods. And if you don't have a, a gang uh, uh, program to, to decrease gang shootings, you're going to have this proliferation of just shootings everywhere. So that's back in. Uh, however, once they get arrested, you, um, they have to be prosecuted for it because that person is going to go back out and take a, and get another gun and commit a crime. Here's another issue that the mayor is addressing now. It's, uh, it's, it's the type of thing where people come in and out of the justice system. It's recidivism. We see it in robbery burglary and grand law, seeing grand law, see auto. The same people getting arrested over and over again. We have a New York district attorney who's downgrading crimes as they come in. We'll write up something for, for a robbery. Let's say, for instance, uh, two individuals steal a person, someone they push it, that woman to the ground, steal the person and run off. That's robbery too in New York City. That's not bail eligible. Additionally, that that, that same crime may be pushed down to a, mis to a misdemeanor uh, chapter uh, 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 pedalosity. These are the problems we're seeing, and they're not being taken care of yet. And that's a long haul for the mayors to do. Yeah, that's the reclassification of crimes, and it also impacts the th the statistics as well. Bob, I I want to touch on something that you and I have spoken frequently about about this ghost gun issue for the okay. edification of the public. We're having more and more issues with ghost guns in the city. Am I correct? It's through the roof as they gradually go up through the years. We're arresting people. We're, we're, we're making the arrests and putting it through, but we're seeing more and more. Where are they coming from is the question. So much so, Lou, that we have a deputy, I'm sure, a full, full inspector involved in tracking them and finding out where they're coming from and developing cases on them. So, yes, it's a big problem in New York City. Yeah, as I mentioned to you in one of our discussions, you know, um, acquiring that frame that is... Um, I would say absent of the parts to make it functional is just a piece of plastic. You know, it's a, it's a replication of, um, 
uh, just a Glock frame. It's a piece of plastic, and it doesn't become a firearm until you insert the locking block, the trigger bar, um, all these other little pieces, um, the transfer bar. There's a lot of pieces that go in, not that many, but enough. And that's when the gun, the frame actually becomes a firearm. You know, the problem, Bob, is that I think New York has a handle on it to a degree, but it's, I would say, somewhat prevalent in other states in the country, especially in the, in the southern states. You can walk into any of the gun stores and buy these frames. And then you can go out and order online or in the gun store all of the internal parts. And then all you need to do at that point is acquire a slide, which is the uh, top of the weapon, which has the barrel inserted into it. And there's no registration on that piece. And you can buy them on the Internet and sometimes directly from the manufacturer. So they've got an uphill battle that they're facing here. And I'm wondering, Bob, do you know... Is there a task force or anything like a gun task force that you and I have been familiar with that's targeting this in other parts of the country? I mean, in other words, it's not illegal in Alabama to sell that frame. You see my point? And so the people in Alabama are telling the federal government, we're not violating the law. We're telling ATF we're not violating the law. You know, we can't be held responsible for what other people do when they get a hold of these frames. So what's, what's the government, what's the city, what are they going to do collaboratively to address this nationwide? Sure. So we've had, we have all kinds of uh, uh, teams and, and, uh, and both with the uh, task forces, both with the federal government as well in, in finding where these things are coming from. So you can argue the iron pipeline, as we used to call it, now the polymer pipeline for the most part. You know, because that's what's, that's what's happening here. These guns are very lethal, and um, you can now add on extended extended mags, as you well know, though. Once you beat five hundred, we had two police officers murdered with a stolen handgun and extended mags on it, 30-round 30, 30, uh, 30 mags, killed two police officers in New York City. Um, and it, the problem continues to grow. Nothing has changed. There's a lot of talk about it, but there's no action to stop it, and that's the big problem going forward. These things are out there. You can't be traced back to one individual, so it takes a really intense investigation to get it done. And that starts from the, the arrest backwards, and that's what we're doing right now. So much so that uh, the, the police commissioner has put uh, an inspector in charge of it just on ghost guns. That's how important we're looking at these things. Interesting. Guys, we're going to take a quick break with Chief Robert Boyce, recently retired chief of detectives of New York City Police Department. He, um, I would say, tutored on some capacities, about 7,000 detectives in the city of New York, which I remind people is larger than most police departments in the country and the world. I, there are a couple of agencies where uh, there are more police officers, Chicago and L.A. to begin with. But just wrap your arms around this. He was responsible for 7,000 New York City detectives in the five boroughs. We're going to be right back, guys. We're going to come right back to Chief Boyce. Stick with us. Instacart. Another interesting concept, you can go to your favorite grocery stores, sign on to their application without leaving your home, the comfort of your home. Just pick out the items you'd like. They'll assign a personal shopper for you and deliver them to the point that you would like them delivered to. Another great concept, very user-friendly, and I'll be honest, we use it also. It's very effective, and they're very, very good. They're very uh, on point. We're back, ladies and gentlemen, and we have the honor of having Chief Robert Boyce, recently retired Chief of Detectives, New York City Police Department, who is a wealth of information. Um, uh, Robert, would you mind telling us where we find your show, how we could find this New York homicide and any of your other endeavors? Obviously, ABC, you can catch them on ABC on segments, but go ahead, Bob. Sure, it's on the Oxygen Network, and um, you could also, they have an Oxygen free app, that you can put down on your phone, you can watch it that way. Or you can look at it on YouTube. Um, these are all reruns right now. So the new season comes out in March, um, and we're preparing for that right now. We're filming as we speak. So that's where it is right now. But you can reach out and watch the show um, on YouTube, or you can catch them um, on the uh, Oxygen Network as they as they are replayed. And, um, and that's the best way to see it. And watch the 12 episodes. I think you'll like it. It's, it's got some very positive uh, response from not only from media outlets, but also from the detectives. They, they enjoy telling their stories uh, because no matter how far we get away from a case, you still own it, it's still in your head, and you want to see it go right, and you want to see the family do well, which is hard to do. And we found out a lot of our detectives are still close to the family. I have one detective who goes out to dinner with the, uh, the father of one of my uh, victims uh, every, every couple of months. So that's good to hear. Um, 
And so it's important to see just the investment, the human investment into a, into someone else's life, someone else's misery, how you can make it just a little bit better. That's what the case is about. You know, I hate to say this to you, but you sound like you haven't left the job. You know that, right? No, I never will. <laughs> <laughs> let me ask you, let me ask you this, Chief. I want to ask you this, Chief. Um, do you think the city's matching notes, like with Philly and Chicago and Atlanta and all these other jurisdictions that are just plagued with a similar problem New York has, although people will probably find it interesting. We're not even in the discussion with Philadelphia and Chicago today as far as shootings on a weekly basis, but what what goes on with them at that point? So we have, we've always had different uh, cities come in, and we visit cities as well. But when I was chief of detectives and chief of Manhattan detectives and chief of Bronx detectives, you would get visited by by certain uh, cities all the time to see how you operate, how you function, what your ideas are. Particularly Detroit, I remember I, I had a long conversation with them. But right now, I think New Orleans is the is the highest per capita in the country right now. It's been like that for a while. Just uh, just the type of thing. I say I, you wonder the size. First of all, the size of the police department. You remember Bill Bratton, how he was able to increase the Los Angeles Police Department, then crime started going down. Not only do you have to increase it, but you also have a, uh, have a strategy in the scheme, which is what he had as well. Gone are the days of suppression policing, about clearing corners and, and, and stop and frisk. That's not going to come back uh, to what we did in the, um, in the early part of this uh, 2001, 2002. It's not going to come back. So you have to pivot through investigations, through good detective work and good gang cases to prevent crime. So let me tell you a little bit about Buzzsprout. Very interesting concept. Basically, it, it, it allows you to set up your own podcast. One of the most advantageous things about using Buzzsprout is it's user friendly. So I encourage you highly, if your inclination is to create your own uh, podcast, please look into uh, Buzzsprout. And by the way, we use it. We're back, ladies and gentlemen. We had a little technical difficulty, nothing unusual today. And as I was saying to you earlier in the show, we have Chief Robert Boyce, recently retired Chief of Detectives in New York City Police Department, who is a wealth of information and brilliant. Um, interestingly enough, it doesn't sound like he really ever left the police department. He's so plugged into what's going on in the, in the city of New York in particular. And subsequently, you know, he's very familiar with um, uh, what's going on across the country because there's a similarity to New York, although believe it or not, as I mentioned just before the break, we're not even close to Philadelphia, for example. New Orleans, as Chief Boyce mentioned, has got a big problem right now. Uh, Chicago. But we were talking about um, the exchange of information or the interaction. You know, I, I want to bring up something before we go go further about the chief, I mean, the commi police commissioner in the city of New York, uh, Commissioner Keychan Sewell. She, she's pretty sharp ticket, right, Chief? Yes, she comports herself extremely well. Uh, she's plugged in. I think the men and women uh, admire her. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of things going on in the city, and she's uh, she's adapted very well and uh, poised and, and knowledgeable. So, and she just didn't, she came from nearby Nassau County. So it's not that far from the city. And so uh, she grew up in New York City. Uh, so I think she, she's re really plugged in. She's got a good team. Uh, she just has a new uh, chief of department who's a very good friend of mine, and a really, really top shelf, shelf guy. So uh, things are looking up, and, I, and you see it. You see that craziness that happened in the beginning of the year where was, things were out of control. Um, the subways remain a problem and still are, but um, the, the, the violence numbers, they've come down substantially. Uh, but the robberies, burglaries, grand losses, those recidivist crimes we talked about, they still pester, they still continue as well as the subways. You know, Chief, I got to say one thing, you know, uh, as you are aware, I was in the city working, I was in Washington and New York uh, working about a week ago, and um, I came in from Long Island, I came in from Nassau County through the Midtown Tunnel, most people aren't familiar with that, so this is really our conversation, sorry folks, and I hit 34th Street, Madison Avenue, I headed north, the number of vacant storefronts is just alarming, and then after discovering that, I couldn't help but notice Lexington and Third Avenues. I mean, the number of vacant stores in the city, which has a direct correlation to your tax base, are overwhelming. You know, I have, of course, real estate brokers that I've uh, dealt with in New York City over the years, and they're telling me that 
the uh, commercial real, ta- real estate space has a 40% vacancy. You know, these are like concurrent battles going on there. They've got to continue to keep this economy thriving, which in the city, which I think is being hindered by the crime. You know, I think people are afraid to come into work. And the other thing I noticed there, and I think you'll agree, the traffic coming into this city is just off the charts. I mean, it's unprecedented, the volume of vehicles in Manhattan. And I think we both know that Penn Station is no delight to arrive in today. You know, so it's it's interesting that a lot of these policies, um, I would say that are being driven right now by the state, not even so much by the city, are uh, really impeding the city's recovery. Uh, I, I want you to comment further on on my observations. And, and, and the other thing, boss, is what's the road back? I mean, we do know bail reform to start with, but let's go into a little bit more about how we get the city back in kilter. So let's talk about our contrarian city which you're 100% right, the commercial uh, real estate base is way down. But you look at the uh, the dwelling, the, the residential, it is through the roof. So people still want to live here. People will still want to buy, uh, you know, live in New York City and have the New York City, the urban experience that it is. Um, and apartment rents are going through the roof. So it's, it's really in contrary of what's going on here. Uh, people are not going to work like they used to. So, um, and what is happening with traffic? Well, we have all these bicycle lanes everywhere. Where, which have taken away major uh, streets, and they're down to one lane. If you go up Madison or Lexington, you're basically on one lane with, when you have a double traffic, the double parked car. So it's problematic to move around, move around the city. There's no question. Um, however, the crime, the crime issue is subsiding somewhat. I think we're going to get something done. Right now, we're in a one-party state in, in New York, uh, in New York. Uh, so you have a Democratic stronghold for the most part in New York City, and now in the state. Um, so when they pass these really um, inexplicable uh, set of laws, the bail reform and others, um, you, want, you want them appealed, but then someone has to say they made a mistake, and that's not going to happen. So it's, it's really up to the mayor and the governor to get together and get some reform going and get this thing turned around, because otherwise you're still going to have these burglars coming out, of the, uh, coming out of the system, these people doing robberies, grand lawsuits, these schemes, these scams that they're doing left and right. We, we, we arrest them, but they're right back out again. And you see really bad cases where an individual um, is, is committing, you know, five, ten crimes. We arrest him on the pattern. He gets right back on again. He's doing the same exact thing he was doing. So there's so many problems in New York City. We have a problem at Rikers, um, uh, Rikers Island, that has to be taken care of. All these things have just come before. In the, once this mayor, the old mayor is out and the new mayor is in. So he's got a tough job of turning things around. Being in the same political party. He's not going to second uh, guess anyone or, or say, well, we, this is what we have to change. And he's a strong language guy, as you know. So we have a lot of things going on. Similar cities, similar issues. Uh, gangs in Chicago, the, the, you know, the, um, the crime levels in Philadelphia, just with, with, uh, with DAs who won't do their job. It's as simple as that. Lou, they took an oath, like the police officer does, to uphold its uh, constitution of the state. They're not doing that. They have to be held accountable. Uh, I I, I agree 100 percent with you. You know the, the thing that's important to remind everyone, and of course you and I have skin in the game in New York because we're we're just we grew up there literally. Is um, and I'm not shy about saying this. Um, De Blasio destroyed the greatest city in the history of civilization, but he had some help from the governor Cuomo. De Blasio did not pass the bail reform law. The governor did, the same way the governor in Illinois just passed no cash bail. You know, so, you know, they, there's an expression, the fish thinks from the head down. You know, the the road back in in the city of New York starts with the governor, not necessarily the mayor or the police commissioner at this point. And I do believe, to be fair to the mayor, didn't he go up to Albany and try to address this bail reform issue, Bob? Wasn't that something that took place early in his administration? He did. It was basically um, left at when he went up there, um, having no power. So there's there's a power at least in in in, um, in in Albany that's creating this and that will not reverse itself. These these reform laws, um, unless everybody wants reform, everybody wants to do the right thing and to be the most in, in the most efficient and, and equitable way. But that's not what's happening here. Uh, listen, I, I you know I, as I said, I live in Brooklyn, New York. I I uh, I, um, I I worked in Brooklyn. I understand it really well in the rest of the city as well. 
So I look around and they said, the people in the tough neighborhoods, they're taking the brunt of this thing. East New York, Brownsville, like I said before, East Flatbush, they're taking the brunt of these these reforms because that's where it's yeah, that's that's where it's affecting the, you know the the families there, and that's what I care about. The South Bronx, all these places, um, and it's 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 happening in Manhattan. It's what's getting all the news, but it's also happening more often in those neighborhoods and those folks who can't go about their daily lives in any kind of uh, safety, and that's the issue. You know, Bob, I I really think that. Um What's going on in our major cities, and this is a simple statement to make, is an example of political failure for obvious reasons. But what I don't understand is why, for example, the Republicans don't go into the minority communities like we're discussing Harlem, Brooklyn North, the Bronx, and and I would say collaborate with the religious leaders and the community leaders to try to convince them that there's an option for the minority community other than the one that they have. You and I both know This last election, the Republicans swept Nassau and Suffolk County, which I remind everyone their combined populations is larger than 38 states in this country. Supposedly, it's been reported that Suffolk picked up almost like 400,000 residents from the city. But the problem I think we have is that neither one of these uh, political entities are making any attempt to insinuate themselves in a proper manner in these minority communities to convince the people to vote a direction different than the one they did. I mean, I'm just blown away that we haven't had enough. And I think that was resounding through the country, not just New York. Nothing's changed across this country in a single major city. Correct me if I'm wrong. Nothing at all. And it's, it's more distressing than ever because the same people got reelected. And um, in a lot of those cities, the same mayors um, and the same governors. So those things are going to continue to fester. I think even more so, the elected district attorneys across this country are, are, are shameful in some of this, in some of these major cities. Shameful, and you can look at them; they're all over the place. Philadelphia, Los Angeles, and certainly in New York, uh, where they're refusing to do their job properly, and that's what's hurting people. We thought, uh, and our thinking was, when I left in my last year, and it carried on after I left until uh, until. It's got to a certain point where the mayor eroded all of our ability to fight crime, uh, which is what he did. Um, so he took homeless outreach from us. And now you see what's, what's going on here in the subways and throughout the city. People walking around in, in cold weather with barely dressed, creating acts, uh, living in a violent culture. This was this was we didn't have this in New York City. We or at least we had it much better than other cities. So that was eroded from us. So you look at these uh, when you have a, a, a horrific crime, they have to be prosecuted. And we thought we had precision policing, which we did. We felt that very few people were, were driving the crime. And if we can keep those people, we can incarcerate them, keep them out of the populace. <clears throat> we'd have a safe city. And, you know, it's the um, cornerstone of any uh, mayoralty is public safety. So we have to get back to those days when we had a, a, a number in Rikers. And I think it was we had around six thousand, six to seven thousand people in Rikers. Now that seems like a lot, but look at New York City: eight point eight point six million people live here. That's a very small number committing this crime. That was at the at the premium at, at the top of our game in the police department. We need to get back to that. We have to need so do so intelligently. I want to discuss something with you also that recently reared its head in the city of New York, which I found rather entertaining. Uh, the mayor is attempting to reinstitute a practice that the police had for as long as I can remember, and I'm sure as long as you can, where they had the discretion to take people who were emotionally ill off the street and bring them for 72 hours to a facility like um, Bellevue, right? And and de Blasio took that prerogative away from the police, and now... Uh, the current mayor, Adams, is trying to reinstitute it. Correct me where I'm wrong here. Yeah. And they're getting push, major pushback, Bob. This is something that we've been doing for decades, for generations. Now we're trying to reinstitute it, and we're getting all this pushback. Am I correct? He seems that way. They're pushing back hard, and I, I think he'll be able to drive it through. So involuntary removal of a mostly deserved person has to, have, has to be in the priority of the police department. You can't let these individuals walk around living like they do. It's inhumane. Are you not doing anybody any favors, especially not uh, someone who's in the throes of mental illness, by letting them stay out in the cold, uh, sleeping on grace and things like that? We had the ability to take someone who's acting out uh, to a psychiatric ward for review. 
Now, that's the problem with the only thing I see with the mayor's plan. You can reinstitute the police department doing it. We had something called homeless outreach, which primarily worked in the subways and in the transit areas where these homeless were. And they would take people in all the time. He took that away from the police department and gave it to the Department of Homeless. When you say he, be specific who he was, Bob. Right. This is, we're talking about William de Blasio, Bill de Blasio. Thank you. He took that away and, and put it to the Department of Homeless. Now, those individuals are not equipped, skilled, or trained to be able to do that because these folks can be oftentimes violent. So they're not going to do it with the same ability that the police department can. Uh, I, no one has any problem with them following us around or anything. All the police officers now are wearing the, um, the body-worn camera. So you can see their actions and they're to be able to articulate why they're doing something. That's not an issue. So all these things should be put back into place. I think this mayor is doing it. He just hasn't put back the homeless outreach to the police department yet. I think they're going to be the primary driver of doing it. So I think it's happening. Yes. But here's the problem, Lou, is that you have to get health and hospitals plugged into this, too. They just can't release these people back into the street after a, after a couple hours of review. They have to have something else. They have to have homeless um, uh, shelters plugged into this. <clears throat> Someone has to be in charge of that. And that's what needs to be done. It's just not a police issue. It's, it's a lot of other support uh, um, uh, agencies as well that have to be part of Bob, you froze. You froze, Bob. I'm back. Okay. Guys, we're going to take a quick break. We're having a conversation with uh, recently retired chief of detectives of the New York City Police Department, Chief Robert Boyce. We'll be right back, guys. We're back, ladies and gentlemen. And as I said earlier in the show, we have Chief Robert Boyce, recently retired chief of detectives of the New York City Police Department. The significance of this conversation today um, although it sounds like we're just really talking about our home, our backyard, New York, it's indicative of what's going on across the country. The problems that we're having, almost every major city is having. And that's really the unfortunate part of this discussion. We were just talking about the mentally ill and, and outreach programs and who is the architect of taking the city in the wrong direction, which is the most recent uh, Mayor de Blasio, which I just don't understand how he got out of Dodge so scot-free but um the one thing i just do want to say is you know after we take them off the street and we determine they're not um i would say mentally acute they're not stable oftentimes you can't return them to their families they're disenfranchised from their families because they're not only threats to themselves they could be threat to other family members so they're back out on the street you know to go back historically geraldo rivera did an expose on willowbrook Chief Boyce probably remembers this. We dismantled that mental institution, then Pilgrim State and Creedmoor. And what we're really talking about today is a systemic failure on the part, not just of the states or the cities, but the federal government to try to create an environment for people who are not mentally well to exist other than the, 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 the gratings in the city of New York, hallways, or Penn Station. And this is really, it's incredible that no one's talking about this. And guys, it isn't just the Democrat, it's the Republican as well. You know, we just gloss over these things, making like if maybe we ignore them, they'll just go away. It's not happening. You know, we're not doing anything to help the homeless. I opened up today, Chief, by saying that we've overpopulated the country. And I support that because we're not taking care of anyone. Our veterans, our homeless, our mentally ill, our elderly, and our children. We're still not taking care of our kids in the learning environment. This is a ridiculous conversation to have, that we've got to put armed people in schools so they can learn. This, this problem starts at the top, period, guys. Now, I do, I do want to say one thing. You know, I don't want to be political. I'm not picking uh, sides. But I, at some point in time, it would be wonderful if they had a conversation in Washington about what they're going to do about the homeless in this country and the mentally ill, because we just can't allow them to operate in the streets with impunity, committing crimes, many of which they're not responsible for because they're not of the right mind. This is a hell of a problem. And I know that you dealt with it you know, professionally, but I have to say, you were riding the, the, the crest of a different wave with a different administration. You were there with former Commissioner Bratton, who's probably the most preeminent police official in my lifetime, at least, or maybe modern time. The man is, again, brilliant. It's almost confusing that he came from our culture. He's so damn smart, and he understands the culture on so many levels. But, you know, I know you were teamed up with him also. You had that, that 
Um, he and didn't he make you chief of detectives? Certainly did. He certainly did. In 2014, he made me chief of detectives. Tell us about that story. Well, I, I was at the time I was chief of Manhattan detectives, and uh, that's not a bad job either. Great job, um, also, so, ladies and gentlemen. It is. So, uh, <laughs> so, and um, he came in, and um, and there was a there's people he brought in John John Miller, Steve Davis, people you know, uh, who were, he was developing his team. And he was looking out, looking for the management team within the police department. And we're putting that together then. So I got the call to come down to meet him at uh, Neary's restaurant. I think you've been there as well, Lou, uh, on the Upper East Side. And then, then he offered me the job there. And I immediately said yes. So, um, and it's, and I was always astounded by his, his, you know, how his acuity, how smart he was about a lot of issues, the broader topics. And he, what he said to me that day is, I don't want to talk about daily crime. You're going to handle that. And I did. And, and so uh, and so that's how it helped me get here today. Um, I was able to go in the air and, and assure people that arrests were being made and that this wouldn't happen again or, or, or this was the end of it. Because if you remember, during my tenure there, we had three um, three terrorist incidents. Now, that's under the purview of John Miller. But the Detective Bureau has assets and we have assets to help uh, the FBI with that crime as well. So we were able to do that and bring down the, the numbers to historic lows. And it, a lot of that was... Uh, partnering with our federal partners, uh, the FBI, the DEA, you know, uh, all these things to 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 tackle this tough problem. And I will tell you, when I left, I thought the city couldn't have been in better shape than it was. And I worked my last day, as you well know. I didn't want to leave. Um, even under uh, Mayor de Blasio, I didn't want to leave. Um, we were doing that well. And then it's in, in a year and a half later, it all went poof. And I see uh, this degeneration. If you remember the Floyd riots, what it did to New York City, we had lost Fifth Avenue. There's things you don't lose in New York City. You don't do that. The entire Soho was 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 sacked by by vandals and uh, and uh, burglary teams. So that's how bad it got. Uh, I I don't know if I would have stayed through that not being able to do my job. And that's that was the issue with me. Would I still be able to do the same job I did in 2018, in 2022, or 2023? Now is we're, we're turning that corner. And, and we have a great chief of detectives, by the way. Jim Essick is a top shelf guy. He's an old school man like me. Um, and he understands the city as well as anybody. He came on the job with me. So uh, Jim's, Jim's a great a great chief of detectives. I see things, you see different crimes that blast onto the public uh, consciousness to the news. And the next day, you'll see that perpetrator walked out of a precinct by a New York City police detective. The job's still getting done. What we have to worry about is this recidivism. It's the same people coming in. Um, coming out of the system and committing crime after crime after crime, and nobody's doing anything about it. Chief, I want to ask you a question just to go off onto this topic about this, uh, this murder in um, Idaho. Curious to hear what your opinion or your perspective is. I told you what mine is. I think this is a little more complicated um, than what's on the surface. You know, unfortunately, and I say this um, in fairness to that police agency, like unless you're dealing with homicides like this, like the city of New York, your skill set in solving them is uh, dramatically different. What, what what are your instincts with this case? I, I think it's it's the high profile and it should be. Yet four innocent um, college students brutally brutally murdered, and now they're trying to find out exactly who did it. And you look at it, it's a forensic case; nobody can make an identification. So the um, so the the, the identification of the perpetrator will be through forensics, through DNA and fingerprints, um, uh, the media, whatever, uh, plate readers, whatever they can find, and tips. That's what's going to solve this crime. Um, and so the police have to work through this. And it, I, I had a similar case with a, uh, with a young jogger who was, who was brutally murdered in Queens. It took me six months, uh, actually to the day, to identify the perpetrator. So these things take time. Forensics have to come in. Uh, and you have to go from there. Your tips are important. You have to follow each one down. I think that's what's being ha what's happening right now out there. They were inclusive from the beginning, Lou. The, uh, the, the, um, where that happened, they brought the state police and they brought the FBI in, which is what they should have done. They're being quiet about their leads, which they should do. So I think we have to have, um, we have, to have some uh, confidence on our law enforcement that they're going to do their best to bring this case in. And, and we can't have rogue, crazy theories coming out of nowhere. Um, they have to be tamped down to a good press office. That's probably the only mistake they're making is in the press office and how they're releasing information that I can see. And it's not incontrovertible. You can, you can uh, clarify issues all the time to the press. 
So that's what I'm saying right now. It's a brutal murder. I agree with you that this savagery right here is going to occur again until we get this person in. And he may have already done this elsewhere. We just don't know. Kind, kind of uh, like uh, other uh, serial killers. You know, you know the reason, uh, Chief, I, I have this serial killer theory is because of how labor-intensive th- these four mur- murders were. He didn't commit a murder on the first floor. He went to the second floor and the third floor. He didn't have one person he targeted. He targeted four. You know, there was some labor uh, involved in this thing, especially since he used a knife. You know, it's not easy unless you really are astute as to how to use a knife on a body to kill somebody. I mean, I just think that this is such a uh, a deviation from a target, a conventionally targeted homicide of this nature. In other words, he didn't go in after one girl or the guy. He went after four people, you know, and that's what really bothers me about this case. And, you know, Ted Bundy, who I was alluding to a moment ago, he, you know, he traversed the country. You know, uh, ending up down in Florida State University, I believe, and and the dorms there. I just think that they've got something on their hands uh, greater than we are 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 willing to maybe wrap our arms around at this point. Uh, I do want to say this as far as the forensics and the DNA, you know, clearly relevant. We're solving a lot of cases today, but you have to have a database to match that against. And I'm certain our FBI, who has probably some of the finest crime laboratories in the world, have already been that route. And they're not tying this to anyone. They keep making reference to some white sedan. I don't know if that's necessarily going to take them to the promised land. Clearly, it's worth worth um, following. You know, I, I this is really an interesting case here and, and extremely tragic because it's impacting the academic environment in which these children are learning once again. You know, our kids are on the receiving end of the crazy in this country. You know, Chief, I want to wrap this today with you. I want to thank you for coming on. It's always a pleasure listening to you. There are some things I'd love to discuss with you, but I won't because they're a little more sensitive. You mentioned the Vetrano case. You know, guys, the thing I want to say to you is, and listening to Chief Boyce, this, this discussion sounds like it's focused on New York. This is what's going on in our country today in various cities. And that's why there's such a relevancy in understanding police practices and policies, you know, and th- there is there is politics attached to this. I wanna make one final comment about the homeless. We're, we're witnessing them drop busloads of migrants at um, 42nd Street and 8th Avenue, the Port Authority building. And they're constructing a facility for them on Randall's Island, which is where they train our firemen. And the homeless people are living in the streets, you know. I mean, it's just like like the cuckoo has completely left the clock here. And what was so interesting is that we watched the media interview some of the homeless people, and they're all going, why aren't they doing this for us? You know, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered here. And I would say that the leadership in the country today, to say it politely, is a little slippery. Maybe there's just so much for them to take on at once. Maybe that's why I come to you and say maybe we've overpopulated the country as because as populations grow, sort of the problems associated with them grow exponentially. So, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Chief Boyce, thank you for joining us. Oh, I'd love to have you back because I know things are going to get more and more interesting as we're going along. You know, I, I don't see any light at the end of the tunnel in any of our major cities in this country because of the politics attached to who's running these, uh, these cities. Guys, thank you so much, Chief. Can't Thanks thank so. you enough, and I'll, I know we'll be speaking soon. Great to be with you. Thank be you. well, my friend. That's Too it, sure. guys, for today. Thank you for joining us, and uh, plug in on uh, Saturday. You'll be able to watch this.